This week's episode is brought to you by Casper. Casper is an online retailer offering premium mattresses for a fraction of the price. The mattress industry has for a long time forced consumers into paying notoriously high markups with resellers and showrooms all taking their cut along the way. Casper is revolutionizing the system by offering an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price. Made in America, the mattresses combine two technologies, premium latex foam and memory foam that provide just the right sink and just the right bounce and come together for better nights and brighter days. And by cutting out all those middlemen, you can get a twin for just $500 or a king size for just $950. And if you've ever gone out mattress shopping, you know those are outstanding prices. And on top of all that, this is all risk-free. You can try sleeping on a Casper for 100 days, and if for some crazy reason you don't like it, you can just return it and pay nothing. They say it's a painless process, but I would know because we love our Casper and had no reason to return it. And when the time comes for the new baby to move up to her big girl bed, she's going to get a Casper, just like her big brother. So if you want a better mattress, and you want to pay a fair price, go to casper.com slash revolutions and use the promo code REVOLUTIONS, which will get you $50 off any mattress you want. Terms and conditions apply. That again, casper.com slash revolutions, the promo code REVOLUTIONS. Hello, and welcome to Revolutions. Episode 4.10, The Third Commission. In November 1795, news finally reached Saint-Domingue of the incredible turn of events back in Europe that we ended with last week. Spain is out of the war. In the all-important north province of Saint-Domingue, this news would change everything. Since August 1791, the slave armies of Jean-Francois and Bissou had occupied most of the province, and they had been able to maintain that occupation because of Spanish support. First, the clandestine support that had seen them transition successfully from passionate insurgents to a stable and pretty well-organized army, and then the official support that saw the Spanish bring that army under their banner. Now, Governor General Laveau had run some successful campaigns against these forces back when he was still Colonel Laveau, and as we saw last week, Toussaint Louverture was making inroads of his own. But in the main, Jean-Francois Bissou had never been seriously threatened. But it was all premised on Spanish support, and that support was now gone. So whatever fancy plans Jean-Francois Bassou had dreamed up over the years, whatever that fourth option we talked about last week might have been, it would remain an eternal might have been. When the Spanish said, we're cutting you off, British agents made contact and offered to replace the Spanish as patrons, but there were a number of problems with this. Logistically, British supplies could never be counted on the way that Spanish supplies could always be counted on, since they were just coming right over the border. But more importantly, the deal offered by the British was not nearly as appealing to Jean-Francois Bassou as the old deal offered by the Spanish. The Spanish had essentially left the slave generals to their own devices, with little or no direct oversight. Bassou was currently living like a de facto king down in this homemade palace of his. The British, on the other hand, planned to insert the slave generals into their regular command structure. They would have to take orders from British officers, do whatever the British said. So Jean-Francois Bassou declined to hop over to the British. Instead, the two slave generals decided it was time to get out while the getting was good. The Spanish offered them asylum as free men, and they said, okay. Each general took with him a cadre of senior officers, and they decamped the island forever. Jean-Francois and Bassou are never coming back. Bassou wound up resettling in Spanish Florida, where he was eventually given command of the black militia there, and there he died in 1801. Jean-Francois and his loyalists, meanwhile, went first to Havana, but the Spanish governor flipped out when this slave general and his entourage showed up, and he begged his superiors to deport them all before they started a slave revolt in Cuba. The Spanish authorities granted this request, and Jean-Francois' group was taken back across the Atlantic to Cadiz. And their exile was not a comfortable one. Though the Spanish kept their word and allowed the black officers to live free, they did not grant them any sort of pension or recognize the ranks they had held during their two and a half years of service in the Spanish army. Jean-Francois himself would die in Cadiz nearly penniless in 1805. 
So the Grand Admiral and the Governor General and Royal Viceroy are now totally out of the picture. With their senior commanders gone, it was finally time for the insurgent army of the North to demobilize. And what to do with them all was a vexing question. Now, these armies had obviously managed to hold out long enough that when their generals ditched out on them, the regular soldiers were not thrown back into chains. They were walking down into a world where they were officially free citizens. And amnesty and reconciliation did seem to be the order of the day. Toussaint, for example, was happy to recruit as many of these guys as he could directly into his own forces. But those who were tired of fighting were welcome to return to work on the plantations as free citizens, though they would, of course, be subject to all the labor laws that were now going into effect. All of this proceeded with no final spasm of death or destruction. And it is pretty remarkable that the final chapter of these original slave armies of the Northern Plains is a story told with practically no bloodshed at all. Now, as we have seen many times on the Revolutions podcast, the removal of a shared enemy often leads to a factional conflict on the winning side. So, with the threat of Jean-Francois Bassou's army removed, tensions within the French Republican ranks quickly erupted into open, armed hostility. The tensions in particular were between two men who stood one rung below Governor General Laveau in the command structure. Toussaint Louverture is obviously one of these two, and the other is a guy we haven't talked about yet, and his name is Jean-Louis Vallotte. Now, we don't know a ton about Vallotte, but he was a free colored born in Saint-Domingue in 1751. He appears to have joined a regiment of dragoons as a teenager in 1768, and was then among those who volunteered to join the expedition to the United States in 1778, where he fought at the Siege of Savannah. After that, we lose track of him, but I feel pretty confident saying that he was not in on Vassan Auger's uprising, because most of the guys who escaped that little debacle wound up fighting with the slaves after August 1791. The next time we see Vallot pop up is when the Second Commission arrives and the battles over the law of April the 4th begin. When these battles led Sontanax to create those free-colored militias who were answerable only to the Second Commission, Vallot wound up a colonel in that militia. Vallot was then one of the principal officers, along with Jean-Baptiste Belly, fighting for the Second Commission during the Battle of Le Cap. And then when the British invaded and Laveau moved his headquarters over to port pie to contain them, he left Vallot in charge of the defense of Le Cap. So, until Toussaint came over to the French side in April 1794, Vallot was the principal Creole officer in the North Province and he was among the very few on the Republican side not absolutely thrilled when Toussaint defected. Because right away, Laveau started to show preferential treatment for Toussaint. And, of course, he was a little miff that Toussaint had been offered a generalship after fighting against the Republic for the last three years. In July 1795, the National Convention approved all the field promotions Laveau had doled out to his principal Creole officers and the convention officially made brigadier generals of, in the north, Toussaint and Vallotte, and then in the south, André Rigaud, and another guy that I have not talked about yet, and that's Louis-Jacques Beauvais. Beauvais was another of these prototypical free-colored men who had struggled for dignity in the old apartheid system. Beauvais had been educated in Bordeaux, and then, along with Vallotte, taken part in the Savannah Expedition, and then returned to Saint-Domingue to be a schoolteacher. When the revolution broke out, he was one of the first to take up arms to defend the law of April 4th, and then he had stuck with the Republic after emancipation, and was now Rigaud's chief lieutenant in the South, and Beauvais, too, is now a full brigadier general. So of the four newly created Creole generals, it was three coloreds, all born free, and then Toussaint, the lone black, born a slave. And Vallot was super annoyed that Toussaint was now his equal not only because he was a black ex-slave, but because Toussaint had spent the last three years fighting against the Republic that Vallotte had put his own life on the line time and time again to defend. Vallotte did not trust Toussaint even a little bit, but as long as Jean-Francois and Bassou were still out there, that conflict would simmer but never boil over. Now that Jean-Francois and Bissou are departing, it's time for Vallotte to boil over. But his anger and frustration with Laveau is really what got him going. 
especially after Laveau moved his headquarters back to Le Cap after having spent the better part of a year in port au Now, probably some of Valat's anger comes from being the boss because the boss is out of the office, and now that the boss is back in the office, it being kind of annoying that you're not the boss anymore. But there was more to it than that. Like, the first thing Laveau did upon his return was release a whole bunch of black prisoners that Valat had been keeping locked up, which possibly implied a continuation of Laveau's growing preference for the blacks over the coloreds. Now, after this initial slap in the face, Laveau then proceeded to really offend Vallot and his allies. Over the past year, the coloreds in Le Cap, under Vallot's protection, had been busy rebuilding the city. As I mentioned in passing, Le Cap had been built mostly out of brick and stone, so though everything flammable had burned in June 1793, the coarse structures all remained. And the colored citizens spied a golden opportunity— They laid claim to all the abandoned white property and built it back up. But when Laveau arrived back in the city, the governor and his treasury secretary were like, wow, guys, this looks great. But just so you know, according to Republican law, property abandoned by emigres automatically reverts to the state. So you can keep occupying the property, but we do expect a small rent. This came as an abrupt and pretty obnoxious shock. But the thing that was really grating is that Governor General Laveau just wasn't one of them. And it wasn't that he wasn't colored, but that he wasn't Creole. He was a Frenchman. France was his home, not Saint-Domingue. So why should he order us around in our own home? And this gets to the heart of the newly forming conflict that we're about to see. Because back in 1791, it was the whites who wanted self-government, and the coloreds allied with the metropole. Well, now that the whites are gone, it's the coloreds who are now chafing under French authority, and the coloreds who will start agitating for self-government. Vallot did not make his move right away, though. In fact, much to Toussaint's great annoyance, Vallot was doing a bit of careful planning. He sent agents out into the camps under Toussaint's command, asking if Toussaint's men were happy with their situation. They said, life in Le Cap has been great for us, Vallot pays us more, and we are treated way better. And according to letters sent from Toussaint to Governor Laveau, we know that at least some of Toussaint's men began to transfer their allegiance over to Vallot. Finally, on March the 20th, 1796, Vallot made his surprise move. He gathered a company of armed men, pushed into Laveau's headquarters, and arrested the governor general. Then he said that because Laveau had lost the support of the people, that Vallot was declaring himself governor general. So, March the 20th, 1796, straight-up armed coup by General Jean-Louis Vallot. To help solidify his position inside the city, Vallot then spread the rumor that the principal impetus for the coup was news that ships had arrived in the harbor and that they were literally carrying chains, that now that the Spanish were gone, Laveau had new orders from Paris to re-enslave all the blacks. Now, one thing we do not know is how much of a role colored leaders down in the West or South provinces, and Andre Rigaud, we are looking at you, had to do with any of this. But we do know that there was no simultaneous rising on their part or ready declaration of allegiance to Vallot, so it's entirely possible that he was just out there acting on his own. But it was also over so quickly that it's tough to tell if it was supposed to be a part of a broader colored insurrection. So men loyal to Governor Laveau managed to get word of the coup spread to nearby army camps, camps that were run by men not allied with Vallot particularly the one led by Pierrot. You remember him? He was the first slave leader to come over to the Republic. He had been fighting alongside Laveau for years now and raised his men to prepare defense of the governor general. But Pierrot was just one stop on the messenger chain. The final destination was Toussaint. Toussaint was in Gonaïve on March the 20th, but when he found out that Laveau had been arrested, he immediately raised his army and sent word back to Le Cap saying, I have raised my army. Meanwhile, Vallot appears to have recognized that whatever careful planning had gone into the coup was not enough. Because just as he had spread the rumor that the French wanted to put the blacks back into chains, allies of Laveau spread the rumor, a rumor they might have actually believed, that Vallot's coup was just the first stage of a plan to hand the city over to the British. It's not like colored leaders haven't done it before. So it's really Vallot who stands for re-enslavement. 
So Vilat was unable to muster unified support for his coup inside Le Cap, and he realized that if Toussaint really did come marching down out of the mountains, that there would be no opposing him. So on March the 22nd, Vilat let Laveau go, and as Toussaint's army did indeed start approaching, 10,000 strong by some estimates, Vilat and his principal conspirators fled the city. Vilat's failed coup was so incredibly beneficial to Toussaint Louverture that it's practically like Vilat was in on some convoluted plan to bring Toussaint to power. Because Toussaint's army, being the reason the coup failed, meant that Toussaint was now the savior of both Governor General Laveau and the Republic. If there was any doubt that the one man in Saint-Domingue Laveau could really count on was Toussaint, those doubts were all gone. As a reward for his service, Laveau promoted Toussaint to deputy governor, second in command of all the French military and subordinate only to Laveau. Technically, this elevated Toussaint even above André Rigaud. So in less than a year, Toussaint had gone from the third-ranking general of a Spanish-backed slave army to second in command of the French colony of Saint-Domingue. And that Spanish-backed slave army he had abandoned no longer existed. Toussaint has very good timing. So Toussaint was now in a prime position to do what it's pretty clear he was now aiming to do, become the master of Saint-Domingue. He enjoyed the loyalty and support of men across the board. The whites in the north certainly found him to be a man they could do business with, and though Vilat had attempted to paint Toussaint as anti-colored, it's clear from his actions over the past year that Toussaint wasn't anti-colored at all. He just wasn't exclusively pro-colored any more than he was pro-white or pro-black. So there were a lot of coloreds who also found Toussaint to be a man they could do business with. And then you've got Laveau writing letters back to Paris now saying, this is the guy that you can count on more than any other. So the government back in France supports him. And then, of course, with Jean-Francois Bissou now out of the picture, there was no one who could challenge Toussaint's claim to be the natural leader of the black majority of the population. So in April 1796, there wasn't anybody in Saint-Domingue with more authority nor commanding more loyalty than Toussaint Louverture. Except at that very moment, a man was stepping onto a ship back in France who could very much challenge all of that authority and loyalty, especially within the all-important black community, because Leger Felicité Santanax is coming back to Saint-Domingue. So as we discussed last week, when it came to colonial matters, the Directory had come to power with two key principles. First, liberty and equality would be upheld. No more slavery, no more racism. Second was the theory that the colonies were now simply a part of the French nation, one and indivisible. The colonies did not require, nor did they deserve, special laws, special treatment, or special restrictions. And to ensure that this new theory of liberty, equality, and unity were upheld, In January 1796, the Directory created a five-man commission to transmit this all to Saint-Domingue and make sure it was obeyed. This is the third commission. And yes, I know the Haitian Revolution loves a good commission almost as much as the French Revolution loved a good coup. So just to remind you, the first commission was sent by the National Assembly in 1791 to confirm the right of colonial self-rule on internal matters. The second commission had then been sent by the Legislative Assembly in 1792 to enforce racial equality, but also defeat the slave uprising without freeing all the slaves. The third commission is now being sent by the Directory in 1796 to guarantee both racial equality and emancipation, and then also officially fold the colony into the French nation, one and indivisible. The most prominent of the new commissioners was, of course, Santanax. After being fully vindicated for his work on the second commission, he was now being put on the third commission to continue his job. Next was the man that Brousseau had so badly wanted to put onto the second commission, Julien Raymond. Raymond, too, had been fully cleared of any lingering political charges in the wake of Termidor, and was now returning to Saint-Domingue for the first time in 12 years. Raymond had started his career in France lobbying the royal ministry to undo its apartheid system. Then he had lobbied the National Assembly for colored equality, then the Legislative Assembly, and then the National Convention, and then he had gotten thrown in jail, 
and now he was lobbying the directory. And through it all, he maintained a laser focus on racial equality and never really paid more than lip service to the idea of maybe general emancipation of the slaves at some point down the road. But with emancipation now settled, Raymond accepted it and was ready to move forward. Now, the third guy I'll mention is Philippe Rome, who had been one of the first commissioners and who will be returning to the colony for the first time in four years, no doubt hoping and praying that when he stepped off the boat in Le Cap this time, there wasn't some new revolt to deal with. The commission was rounded out by two other guys who do nothing of any importance, so I won't trouble you trying to remember their names. The third commission got on a ship in April 1796, and when their convoy sailed, they brought along with them some military reinforcements led by General Rochambeau, who we last saw taking up a post in Martinique. And when we last saw Rochambeau, I mentioned that he would return to Saint-Domingue with the Leclerc expedition, which he does, but I totally forgot that he also makes this little interim return to Saint-Domingue with the Third Commission. So Rochambeau brought with him 1,200 men, which doesn't seem like much if the French are really serious about pushing the British out of the colony. But they also brought with them 20,000 muskets. It had become clear to everyone that sending more European reinforcements was a waste of resources, and also, I suppose, lives, and that one of the biggest practical benefits to emancipation was that all those new black citizens would become patriotic soldiers of the Republic. So the Third Commission escorted the armaments necessary to create a black army. A black army full of soldiers who knew the terrain and who would not just drop dead and who would then go beat the crap out of the British. This is what Danton meant when he shouted, this is the death of the English, after the National Convention approved general emancipation. The Third Commission arrived in Le Cap on May the 11th, 1796 and discovered that since they had departed, there had indeed been a revolt, but not a mass black uprising. Rather, Vallot's aborted coup. So the aftermath of that coup defined the new political environment they stepped into. And that new environment is a weird through-the-looking-glass version of the political environment we've seen thus far. Because as I just mentioned, ever since the French Revolution had hit, the whites had been the ones agitating for self-government, while the coloreds had been the staunchest supporters of the metropole and then the republic. Well, now that's been flipped. The whites who remained in Saint-Domingue were way off of home rule and welcomed full integration with France. It is now the coloreds who are agitating for self-government and possibly even independence. So why the switch? Well, that's easy. The whites are now way less powerful than the coloreds. And where the coloreds had once looked to France as their protector, they now did not need a protector and the Metropole represented merely a check on the power they believed they had fairly won for themselves. Now, nowhere was this through-the-looking-glass version more apparent than in the attitude of Sontanax himself. Remember, he had concluded as soon as he arrived in Saint-Domingue back in 1792 that the only people he could really trust were the coloreds. Well, since emancipation, he had changed his mind completely. The slew of colored defections to the British had really ticked him off, and then stepping off the boat to find that General Vallot had just staged a coup against Laveau, Sontanax now identified the coloreds, not as the Republic's best friends in Saint-Domingue, but their worst enemy, well, aside from the British. The Third Commission had been sent to keep Saint-Domingue free and keep Saint-Domingue French, and the coloreds now clearly stood in the way of that mission. So if not the coloreds, now who does Sontanax now see as his potential best friend in Saint-Domingue? Well, the blacks. And there was no doubt that the black community was 100% ready to be Sontanax's best friend. They all knew Sontanax. They all loved Sontanax. He was the emancipator. The undisputed claim to leadership of the blacks that Toussaint had been cultivating was suddenly challenged by a very credible rival a rival who had freed all the slaves and then fought for the republic that had guaranteed that freedom at a time when Toussaint wanted nothing to do with it and was in fact fighting against it. So Toussaint met with Sontanax and said all the right things, but I have to imagine that from their very first meeting, Toussaint was trying to figure out a way to get Sontanax the hell off the island. Now luckily for Toussaint, 
With the cupboards identified as problem A1, there was no need to rush into a confrontation just yet. And the third commission did indeed begin with the problem of what to do with the cupboards. So right away, they ordered General Vallot tracked down and arrested, which they appear to have done in very short order, because Vallot was then put on a boat and deported back to France for trial. Now, I can't for the life of me figure out exactly what happened to him after that, but obviously something about the constantly changing state of revolutionary politics back in Paris led Vallot to not be convicted of anything, because he's going to return to Saint-Domingue as one of the rehabilitated colored exiles, accompanying the Leclerc expedition sent by Napoleon to take back control of the colony from Toussaint Louverture, but now I'm getting ahead of myself. After dealing with Vallot, the Third Commission then turned to the problem of André Rigaud in the South. Aside from Toussaint, Rigaud had been the most important ally the French Republic had in the colony, and Paul Varel certainly trusted him enough to hand over a kind of emergency absolute authority in the South to Rigaud. But now that the Third Commission had arrived, it was time to cancel that emergency authority and restore normalcy. And what the Commission meant by normalcy was military officers not having independent authority to just do whatever they wanted. They would have to answer to the commissioners. So Sontanax put together a small delegation to go down to Lakai and investigate the situation as a first step towards winding down Rigaud's emergency dictatorship and restoring normal government. But curiously enough, for this mission, not one of the five commissioners went along. Instead, Sontanax picked some locals to go and specifically some white locals, who turned out to be really bad men for the job as they are about to make a giant mess of things. Now, I suppose it's credible that Sontanax wanted to stay in Le Cap, where he had spent the majority of his life in the colony, and you obviously don't want to send Raymond down there if your intention is to rein in the coloreds. Philippe Rome, meanwhile, was already heading over to Santo Domingo to begin the process of transferring authority of the whole island from the Spanish to the French, because remember, that's also supposed to be happening. And then the other two guys had no ties or connections or special knowledge whatsoever. So instead of any of the commissioners going, Sontanax picked these white locals to go down. Now, I don't want to get too deep into these guys, because they're going to come and go very quickly. But one of them was a guy named Andre Ray. And in 1791, Ray had been one of the most vocal pro-white anti-colored agitators in the whole colony. Rigaud actually suspected that when the white-colored civil war broke out in 1792, that Ray had tried to assassinate him. Meanwhile, one of the other guys was known to be nothing more than an opportunistic con man, so if the Third Commission thought these guys were going to do anything but bungle the job and provoke a major crisis, well, they thought wrong. But accompanying this little delegation was also a senior French military officer named General Desfourneau, who was ordered to bring Rigaud's Legion of the South into the regular army command structure. This delegation arrived in the South a few weeks later and started stirring up trouble immediately. Before they even entered Lakai, they first went round on an inspection tour of the plantations of the South, and everywhere they went, they intentionally stoked black resentment of the coloreds. They told the black cultivators that they were all being exploited by the coloreds and that these rules and accompanying punishments were not what France wanted for them, that Rigaud and the boys are planning on restoring slavery the first chance they get. And I'm sure you've noticed by now that from here on out, everyone is going to be telling the blacks that the other side wants to put you back in chains. When this delegation then got into Lakai, they made an inspection of the city's jail and discovered there 900 prisoners, 898 of whom were either white or black. It would appear that in Rigaud's regime, coloreds did not go to jail for anything. So with very little tact or diplomacy, the delegation began to assert a new governmental structure, and then Desfourneau told Rigaud that the days of running a truly independent command without oversight were done, and you now have higher-ups you need to be taking orders from. Rigaud and his colored allies were not going to take this lying down, but to prevent them from organizing any real resistance, Desfourneau announced that Rigaud and the Legion of the South were to undertake an immediate offensive into the mountains of the Grand Anse surrounding British-held Jeremy. Now, I am totally willing to believe that given the nature and attitude of the delegation, that this offensive was not just meant to distract Rigaud, 
but discredit him and his men. The offensive had very little chance of success. If you look back to episode 3.40 on the French Revolution, we are now at the point in the war back in Europe where the British have elected to abandon land action on the continent and focus entirely on the naval war. Well, part of that new focus was booting the French out of the Caribbean for good. And by July 1796, 12,000 British reinforcements were now arriving in Saint-Domingue. So when Rigaud attacked, he was attacking fortifications as well-manned and well-armed as they had ever been. When the assault failed, Desfourneau put the blame squarely on Rigaud's incompetence and the lack of patriotic resolve in the Legion of the South. Desfourneau then ordered the arrest of a few of the principal colored leaders in Lakai to complete the hostile takeover by these agents of the Third Commission, and this was all finally too much for the coloreds. With Rigaud still on his way back from the failed campaign, coloreds in and around Lakai, led by Rigaud's brother, by the by, rose up in armed rebellion. And to build up their ranks, they marched around the plantation surrounding Lakai and told all the black cultivators, you guessed it, the delegates have lied. France means to reimpose slavery, and these delegates are here to put you back in chains. Soon they had raised an army nearly 4,000 strong and marched into Lakai. On August the 11th, 1796, they entered the city and let loose their fury on any white they saw, unleashing a full-blown massacre. Andre Ray and General Desfourneau managed to get on a boat, and they sailed over to Santo Domingo, but the other delegates were not so lucky, though they were able to seek refuge with General Beauvais, who put them under his quote-unquote protection. Then Rigaud came marching back into Lakai with three or 4,000 men of his own. He met with the delegates, and they begged him to stop the killing and restore order by any means necessary. Rigaud promptly stopped the killing. And when it was done, about 300 whites lay dead in the street. But Rigaud then expelled the delegates from the south and sent them back to Le Cap with a message that because things are still so unsettled, I'm just going to go ahead and maintain my emergency authority until further instructions come from France. When these guys made it back to Le Cap, Sontenac in particular was furious and denounced Rigaud's actions, but there was very little he could do beyond stomp his feet. The principal enemy in Saint-Domingue really was the British, and without Rigaud, there would be no expelling the British, and it certainly would be insane to try to break Rigaud by force at this point. That would be a disaster for everyone. So, for the moment, Rigaud holds his little de facto dictatorship. While these events unfolded in the South, the Third Commission busied itself restoring normalcy in the North. The Third Commission, broadly speaking, adopted Toussaint's vision for the future of Saint-Domingue. The three races must all have a place, but the plantation economy must also be maintained, and the blacks must be the principal laborers. But they did adopt one of Rigaud's innovations, that truly abandoned plantations that had reverted to the state should be leased out to private individuals. It seemed to provide the best incentive to get them back up and running, and provide the government with a revenue stream. But unlike in the South, where connections to Rigaud were key, in the North, public auctions would be held. Now, obviously, this still means that men with money are going to dominate the auctions. But Sontanax had hopes that in the end, Saint-Domingue might become a mixed blend of Toussaint's vision for the future, and then that fifth option we talked about last time, blacks living and working for themselves. Sontanax hoped that black cultivators and foremen might be able to pool their resources and put in collective leases on property. But when the bidding started, none of those collectives had the resources to compete with the real men of means. And who were the real men of means now in the North? Well, a new elite caste is forming that is about to become majorly, hugely important. Black Army Officers. As I'm sure you've noticed by now, the difference between being a slave and being a cultivator isn't that huge, and the money you made was never going to be enough to really allow you any kind of upward mobility. If you were a cultivator, there was a 99% chance you were going to remain a cultivator until the day you died, and then your kids were going to become cultivators after you. The only institution in Saint-Domingue that offered a black man any chance of bettering his lot in life 
was the army. If you showed some talent, you could rise to be an officer, bigger share of the plunder, better opportunities for economic and social advancement. And it's right here, in mid-1796, that we really see the fruits of this begin to be harvested. Toussaint himself acquired the first of many plantations he would come to own in his life, then his chief lieutenant, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, who I swear I'll introduce more fully when the time is really right, started buying and leasing property all over the colony. Their fellow officers then joined them in property acquisition, and by the end of the year, you had your first batch of ex-slaves vaulting into the ranks of the planter class. Julian Raymond, ever the pragmatist, couldn't resist a deal when he saw it and acquired extensive new holdings at this same time. And if you remember from way back when, the Raymond family fortune had been built by acquiring abandoned plantations, so this was all right in his wheelhouse. Adding to the slow entrenchment of a new elite in Saint-Domingue were the rules of who would have a political voice in the new system. The Third Commission had orders to hold elections to select Saint-Domingue's delegates to the Council of 500, and there were now property requirements to be a voter. Remember, when the Directory came to power, they brought with them the old active-passive citizen distinction. In 1796, maybe 5% of the population of Saint-Domingue could actually meet those requirements. So acquiring property was not just about economic advantage, it was about political advantage. When the elections got going in the fall of 1796 to elect delegates back to the Council of 500, Toussaint Louverture canvassed hard for his two favorite candidates, Governor General Laveau and Commissioner Sontanax, you know, the two guys who stood in the way of his own upward trajectory. Now, Laveau, for his part, was perfectly amenable to being elected. He was coming up on his fourth anniversary in command of Saint-Domingue, and not one single day of it had been easy. He had fought in street riots against angry whites and pitched mountain battles against black insurgents, and he had fought the British and the Spanish. He had been the target of a coup. Laveau was probably pretty tired, and I would not blame him. But Toussaint also pitched his candidacy in terms of making sure that there was a voice back in Paris who could defend Toussaint's tricolor future for Saint-Domingue, a vision of the future shared by Laveau. So Laveau said, all right, let's do it, and he was elected. Also elected on this slate were Louis Dufay and Jean-Baptiste Belly, who were already, of course, still in Paris, ready to just roll into their new offices. And then, yes, Sontenac was elected. Unlike Laveau, Sontenac was really resistant to this idea. He had just gotten back to Saint-Domingue and believed that he was essentially coming back to complete his life's work. Going back to Paris was the last thing he wanted to do. But Toussaint was able to convince enough voters that Toussaint was the best man to have back in Paris, speaking French to the French government on their behalf, leave Creole business to the Creoles back here in Saint-Domingue. So, against his will, Sontenac was elected a delegate to the Council of 500. But though elected, he refused to leave. He said, I am going to stay and complete my term as commissioner. So in October 1796, Governor General Laveau boarded a ship to go back to France and took with him Toussaint's two sons, who were to be educated in France, but Sontenac did not join them. But though the rivalry between Toussaint and Sontenac was now growing, on the surface they remained allies. And so when Laveau left, Sontenac named Toussaint commander-in-chief of all the French forces in Saint-Domingue. And I mean, who else could he choose? Any other candidate likely would have provoked a whole new rebellion. So we're going to leave everyone there for now. Toussaint is now commander-in-chief of all the military forces in Saint-Domingue, but he still has to contend with Sontenac. André Rigaud is still running the South as a personal dictatorship, and the reinforced British continue to occupy territory across the West and South provinces. And I sure hope nothing happens back in France to upset this new balance of power. (laughs) 